I, I'm just planning, when we get to episode 10, I'm just going to, episode 10 is going to be an entire list of corrections. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to read. <laughs> 14 hours long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alright, well, let you guys start then. Or, we, we, got, we, will have, we got him in an Ed episode soon, though. Are you yeah. sure you want to be cancelled? <laughs> Are you sure? Are you sure you want to get cancelled? <laughs> that early on. <laughs> That's true. That early on. <laughs> this whole thing is a ploy just to get you cancelled, though. Cancel, yeah, cancelled by. Uh, cancelled by. Who is in charge of that at the moment? He's probably Hitler. Like, oh, I almost dead. said it used to be in his, in his um, <laughs> It's not IBS. IBS because yeah. IBS. Did you see his recent remarks? These about how the lockdown was because the government had been bullied by the scientists. <laughs> Fair enough. Cut by the scientists. Cut by the. He basically did say cut. <laughs> I know everyone's mad because Boris Johnson walked out midway through Theresa May's speech. <laughs> uh-huh. As if we're supposed to respect either of them enough to be offended by that. Mm-hmm. Uh, up until last week, I'd literally forgotten about Theresa May. Oh, I don't Fully know why forgotten. she's bringing herself back. Yeah. She was doing so well because everyone had forgotten she existed. Yeah. Mm. Well, we cancelled her. Like, that was like a Matrix level backbend <laughs> of just dodging a machine gun fire of bullets. <laughs> And it's like she's seen a few left and she's like, oh god. She's like, but what if? For old times' unless, sake. Unless. It's like when Karen Blair by she's, I don't know, she, yeah, she's been kind of making interventions for, for quite a long time. So I was talking about, well, she intervenes for Brexit type things, didn't she? I mean, like, even the Tories don't have the gall to do what Labour have done and just got rid of them previously, you know, who's liable to yeah, criticise the, the president administration. <laughs> And like Boris members. Johnson cancelled so many MPs, like yeah. and she got away with it because they have some sense of uh... it's class solidarity. <laughs> well, no, I mean I'm talking about like within, uh, mm. like the. Uh, it's because 19- it's because they all went to the same schools and they all fucked the same dead pig. I was going to say like the 1922 club <laughs> <laughs> had sex with the same 1922 people. One thousand nine hundred twenty-two. Children, you have to <laughs> That's actually why they're called that. We love the Tories, don't we? We got the whole gang here. We got Dan, Ed, Jack, Meow, who I thought was called Meow Griff. Meow Griff. Yeah, I thought it was Meow Griff. Because you all fight all around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it sounded much cooler. Meow Griff into Daffodil. Is Meow Griff named Meow Griff after. Griff is not a Star Wars name, is it? Is Meow Griff named after uh, Meow Griff Thatcher? Yes. Cool. Apparently so. Apparently <laughs> like, I, mean, I, 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 I Yeah, I do not bring this up, nor, nor do I. A boy cat, a girl's name, right? Mm. Oh, it is, so it is a boy cat. Do you know that? I didn't know that either. Uh-oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah has a gender discrimination. I was entirely wrong honor, about this cat. the radical fairness. <laughs> <laughs> no. Woke rad <laughs> Yeah, woke rad fairness. Well, that's why, that's why each, uh, it, she... <laughs> Bay has a. Uh, she's getting a mic to say her piece, yeah. redemption story. I found out that my friend Mike Coupe, um, who was sending me lots of emails, is head of one of the COVID programs. That's why I'm not getting emails. One of the programs spreading COVID? One of the like, government <laughs> yeah, undercover yeah. programs. You mean he's setting up 5G? <laughs> yeah, he the... works for Verizon. No, he's the CEO of Sainsbury's and he's got such a good name and his face just does not match. He just looks like a deputy head. <laughs> no, bless him. He does not deserve the name Mike. No. No. All right, now we got all the cats. Right. All right. All right. I don't really care. The cats can stay. Cats can stay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're fine with the cats. <laughs> Sorry about that. I have no idea who that was. <laughs> <laughs> Some guy. Uh, we really got to lock the door when we do this. Showed up. Lock the doors. Uh, um, what an eventful week. Wow. You know how I, I, I was reminded of the existence of John Podesta? Was his name John Podesta? <laughs> Yes. For some reason, I found myself watching um, <laughs> some footage from 
2016 election night. All right. And, uh, and did you remember? Did you ever hear that conspiracy theory? I don't think it was ever actually a real conspiracy theory. It was uh, like one perpetuated as a joke. Uh, but I like it so much that it was nice <laughs> to be reminded of it again. Where he went on Stephen Colbert and said that said something to the or maybe one of the talk shows. Who knows? Uh, for sake of argument, um, said something about his willingness to. Um, disclose the existence of UFOs should there be oh, any yeah, evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. the conspiracy came that they they then could not let Hillary Clinton win because <laughs> because of UFOs. Be, because of UFOs. Yeah, wow. That's why Donald Trump had to be president. Here's the thing. I feel like there's a certain segment of American society that'll just vote for whoever is like vaguely like I'll tell you the truth about 9-11 when I get into power. <laughs> so, you know, all I'm yeah, saying, yeah. Maybe, aspiring leftists, I mean, maybe, all I'm saying. Yeah, maybe the strategy with Trump was basically that, like, we've we've tried so long, like, voting for the person who seems most likely to actually disclose it. Yeah. Let's go with the person who seems most likely to accidentally. Yeah, 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 exactly. He left his pocketbook, and it's like, oh, my God, he had all the notes on Area 51 and 9-11. <laughs> all my favorite numbers. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, how are you feeling? Uh... I've been intentionally staying <laughs> staying aloof from everything. So whatever. Right now it looks like what uh what's his name? Uh Biden is uh <laughs> this is so much I can't. What, who, Biden's won guy? a couple more states. Looks like he's gonna that win. Guy. Anyway. He looks on the cusp. He looks yeah. about on the cusp. We yeah. might be able to break the news to you yeah. a week but live, but a week <laughs> yeah. late. Guys, yeah. it looks like it's not gonna be burning. <laughs> <laughs> looks like what in fact he couldn't pull this one out. <laughs> I really thought he had it. I really yeah, thought he yeah. had it. He might sneak in somehow. He might. You know never what, know. I don't know what. The, there's been. I've seen a meme going around where it's like <laughs> Bernie Sanders comes in with a steel chair at the last minute. Yeah, yeah like, exactly. It would be funny if Trump orders a recount and they're like, "Oh, we just saw B, <laughs> and we thought it was." We thought actually, it was turns out all of these people yeah. that we thought had voted for Biden have actually written in. <laughs> Bernie Sanders. Classic. That would be a classic mistake. mistake, mistake. mistake. Just quite too close in the alphabet. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, anyway, yeah, I don't know. Fine, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, whatever. I became a bit worried that he might actually lose at one point. And I was trying to sort of work out how I felt about that possibility. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like cool to see Trump lose, but that's about where it ends. That's about where it ends. At least for me, because it's kind of yeah. like, uh, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was very pleased not to be heavily invested. Yeah. I think if I were heavily invested, it would it's probably for that's all of thing. those people listening who were heavily invested. I'm sure you've been through quite a roller coaster. Yeah, well, that's I, fe the thing. I feel for you. Yeah, so many. I don't know. So many. I feel like so many leftists who are like uh, gung ho, myself included, about like anti Biden stuff. Then when it came down to it, I think if I was like in America, I would feel a lot more like uh, dread about this election. <laughs> but yeah. it's funny. Every all the leftists who are like. Ah, oh, dude, I don't care. I don't care at all, bro. Whatever, whoever wins, whoever is gonna win is gonna win. At the end of the day, like everybody's still glued to the TV. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Well, although those, having said that, those, like it's four, it only happens every four years. It's one of those yeah. events where it's fun. It we is, don't get the Olympics. It's kind of like yeah, it's kind of fun. I think yeah, it is. I don't know. I'm not staying up for an election for a while. But. Yeah. I did not stay up for this election. No, I went to bed. It was actually really nice not having my sleep schedule line up with the news cycle. So it's just like. Yeah, because like going to bed at a reasonable time and then getting up, it was just like not much well, I mean, to happened. Be, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, your sleep cycle like, did kind of meet up with the news cycle, right? Yeah. Is that like, yeah. I don't know, you woke up on Thursday morning and there was some result. Of Friday. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know exactly. Yeah. 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 But I sleep for four days. Maybe I'll be awake able to wake up and there's an answer. Yeah. But it, it did at least feel like okay, I can get up in the morning and still be watching it as it exactly. happens, kind of thing. Yeah. As opposed um, to what happened to me last time, whereas I woke up in the middle of the night and I left the radio and for some reason Donald Trump was making a speech. <laughs> you're like, what? I'd gone to bed fully assuming. I mean, I suppose everybody went through that experience. You know, it's crazy. 2016, we were so close to instituting socialism with Hillary Clinton. It's so fun. It's such a bummer, dude. We were so close. Uh, I know. I know. Almost anyway, there. this time. This, this time, time, this time, time we're going to do it. Uh, welcome welcome to Auxiliary Statements. <laughs> I completely forgot to do that. At least we've only been recording for 16 minutes. Yeah, that's just a sufficient amount of preamble <laughs> talking. Just you're just recording the, the, the checkup. Yeah, check. the checkup, the check-in. Check check. Um, yeah. My is name it? is Jack. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's my name. My name is Dan. Um, and I, th I, th I think this, this is the dynamic that we've developed for <laughs> introducing the pod, isn't it? Yeah. But like, 
I don't know how comfortable I feel that I've just abbreviated podcast. Yeah, I was gonna. I, I'm, I'm not gonna do that up. again. I'm uh, not yeah. gonna do that. I'm glad again. you bought it up. Maybe I have to edit it out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or I'll just we'll record you saying "cast" at the end of this, and I'll just splice it in. Podcast. <laughs> really awkwardly. <Yeah>. Podcast. <laughs> uh, That's when you can put, mess with the voice. And yeah, exactly. Put the picture. Yeah. Um, well, today. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to talk about the election anymore. I don't know. It's really, you want to, no. yeah, anything else you want to say? No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. I, don't think it was any, I, I just wanted to talk about aliens. It's, yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah, and look yeah, where yeah. it wound us. But uh, at some up, point, if we get a chance to talk for an hour about aliens yeah. and, and and futurism, some combination. I was going to say, I'm surprised that it didn't that. it didn't wind up into a discussion about Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. we'll save that. You know what I was thinking about today? Uh, we'll get to the episode stuff here in a second. But I was thinking about how interesting <laughs> we're, it is. We're, we're feeling quite unprepared for this episode. <laughs> yeah. So we're just, we're just trying to pad the hour out, pad the time Yeah, exactly. Out. Oh, Jesus yeah. Christ. <laughs> Still have 40 more minutes, minutes to talk. <laughs> um, I was thinking about how, uh, what it says. You're more of a sci fi guy, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm definitely more of a fantasy guy. I had to query right? that, really. Yeah. Okay. Definitely more of a fantasy okay. guy. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know where we're going. We've got the division. Division of labor. The division of labor. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, that's that. That was that. That was what you wanted to. That's all I wanted okay, to say. Okay. That's I what I was thinking this was about. Going to lead into. It came, well, it came into my brain, and I was like, "Oh, that's weird." And just double check. It. It's because just I've been watching check. a lot of Next Generation, rewatching a lot of Next Generation recently, and uh, nice. I was like, "This is cool, but it'd be cooler if they had swords." You okay. know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> that's yeah. It's never been yeah. It's not my vibe at all. Um, <laughs> How the holodeck episodes about... where they go back and do like Shakespeare and stuff. I'm yeah, like, let's just do that fencing and stuff. Don't we? Yeah, but it's a little bit cooler. I mean, oh, I see. Still it's, still, cool. it's still a sword. It's still a sword. Okay, a That's sword why... is a sword is a sword. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, what are we talking about? <laughs> I was like, let's stop talking about the election and get to this. What about swords? Um, we're back. It's the the fantasy realm of the, the fantasy realm of the pod oh, okay. of the. Of the kingdom of pod. We are back. We are back. Back what, at it. We're talking about the same thing as last week, because yeah. we finally finished the book. Yeah, and I can't remember what we said last week, so we might say all the same <laughs> yeah, thing again. Yeah, go back and listen to it, leave a comment saying if we're talking about the exact same thing. <laughs> Origins of Capitalism, I'm going to say her name correctly this week, Ellen Meeksons Wood. Excellent. I said Meeksons Woods. I said uh, Meeksons Woods. I said Meeksons Wood. Wood. Yeah. And I think that's about it. But I pretty yeah. much mispronounce it every single yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about the rest of the book. So part two. Yeah. I guess plus some. Um, and yeah. And here we are. We're talking about it. And it'll be great. I'm really excited for this episode. God, what's our recording time? Man? <laughs> I was going to say, I finished the book last night. Okay, I finished the book. I Actually, I haven't read the conclusion. So I actually haven't finished oh, the book. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're probably not going to talk about the last chapter much at all. Because it very weirdly showed the kind of general structure of this book was that like she talks about defining capitalism in the first bit. Talking all about the incorrect, wrong, idiot, dumb theorists who came before her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she goes in to talk about England and why England rules. Kind of. Mm, that's not really what she says. Or finishes, ends up ruling the capitalist world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And um, then really, randomly... Then very strangely, the last chapter is just about uh, postmodernism. Mm. There were some yeah. bits of that chapter I was skim reading. Yeah, there were some bits that were quite interesting. Sure. In the sense that, like, um, I, it, it's interesting. To, well, she's she's kind of like she's explaining some of the inconsistencies in the concepts of modernity and postmodernity and the Enlightenment, um, or some of the contradictions in what those words mean, um, and basically saying the root of cause of those contradictions is a basically a misunderstanding of they don't factor in that this thing called the origin of capitalism happened right in the middle of the period which they're trying to talk about kind of thing yeah, and yeah. quite how impactful it was on the enlightenment and so on yeah so so what 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 the french enlightenment gave us and what the english enlightenment gave us were two quite or the idea the english enlightenment for one of them mm. um gave us were two totally different things and when they tried to combine together they ended up with this thing. yeah 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 well it was very abbreviated it's very truncated i think yeah, yeah, that yeah. chapter is very short and just yeah. kind of seemed shoehorned in yeah but it, it was yeah it was nice to see that like um yeah 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 i mean it's certainly one of the one of the chapters that was added much like what added in the, mm. in the re-editioning yeah know, sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, um but, but yeah it was interesting hmm. why why the focus on rights in the case of france compared to yeah britain i suppose yeah yeah so i think yeah today i mean we're gonna be talking a lot about england we're gonna be talking a lot about uh this uh little foggy little island um and yes 
So, yeah, so last time we talked about how uh, one of the things we talked about was how stable feudalism was, right? Mm -hmm. You brought up the point that it was like, it's basically like a zero growth economy when it's done kind of in like the classic uh, view of feudalism, right? Because everyone's just kind of producing the same thing over and over. Nobody's really reliant on competitive markets or anything like that. There are no, um, uh, what are they called? Uh, there are op market opportunities, right? And that's the distinction that Wood makes. So is what? it? Oh, no, <laughs> no it's not. What? God, <laughs> don't do that. Jesus. I was genuinely, yeah, I was genuinely not trying to catch you out there. Sorry. Meekson's Wood. Wood, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe I should just call her Meekson's Wood. Um, anyway, um, but yeah, so it was. it's interesting then that we go on to find that this weird thing called capitalism started out of, basically out of nowhere, kind of an accident, not really planned that much at all, and it really only happened, her argument is, um, uh, in England and not in cities, right? So it happened mm. in the countryside. Mm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so it goes against the, obviously it goes against the commercialization view that guys like our boy Smith had, Adam Smith, um, friend of the pod, but also uh, Marxist views of like the bourgeois revolution of ushering in change and you have to have the bourgeois revolution to get your country where it needs to be and then you can have the socialist revolution, blah, 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 blah. So we talked all about that last week, right? Yeah, and she starts to develop some of those ideas in the next chapter. Um, interesting, not to contradict what you were saying about feudalism being... Um, Uh-oh. <laughs> ...being stable. Um, but she also does posit quite a lot of ways in which it was developing. It could be uh, incredibly complex. Um, I, I mean, much like what she's looking for... It, much like what she's looking for an explanation for capitalism which explains the specificity of capitalism like feudalism had a huge number of uh, sp certain specificities which then had an economic logic which played out um, and it resulted in quite a lot of different um, different outcomes and circumstances um, so she's sort of yeah as an expansion of the commercialization theory she starts to talk about um, or uh, as a um Addendum, yeah, an auxiliary yeah, statement. As a, <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Maybe just an all-out criticism kind of thing. Um, mm, no, <laughs> uh, mm, 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 mm. that um, the the idea that expanding uh, European trade sort of uh, led into capitalism. She's saying basically that there was a very feudal model of trade. There was there is a way that you could do trade, um, which operated very much along feudal and not capitalist principles. Um, and she, she's also saying that she's also talking about um, explanations which focus on the growth of cities. We talked sort of talked about this last week that like the um, the the thing that precipitated the the emergence of capitalism was the growth of cities and a particular type of city dweller who came to form the basis of a um, new contesting class the bourgeoisie obviously that's not what she agreed to. that's not an interpretation which she agrees with kind of thing sure. rather she's making the case that um you can have quite large cities under feudalism um and they are um not governed by any type of e even remotely proto-capitalist logic they're thoroughly um feudal also in their makeup and their sure. adherence to economic laws of motion which are mm. which feudalist. Are not and i suppose yeah. yeah i suppose um Although we talked about it to some extent last week, it's going to be very uh, significant this week, so it might it bears uh, repeating. Um, the The basic distinction she's making is that uh, under capitalism, um, the exploitation of the the working producing class is economic. Um, it's the the exploitation the the extraction of the surplus happens in the economic process itself compared to feudalism where um the exploit the appropriation of the surplus by the ruling class by the landlord or what have you um as it develops by the state official as we're going to hear um it's something that has an ec extra economic character it happens outside of and after the actual physical process of production um the landlord comes and takes your stuff after you've uh, yeah. produced it kind of thing and in extra economic ways kind of like what you're saying not not uh things that are responding to market imperatives or anything like that um your stuff's getting taken 
just because, right? Yeah, and yeah. so this kind of this kind of leads us into one of her points where she tries to again refute. She spends a lot of this book refuting. She refutes <laughs> the idea that um, other nations or city states or things like that that we think of as proto capitalist weren't capitalist. She basically she, says no, no. So her two examples are her two big examples are the Dutch, mm -hmm. um, the Dutch Republic, the Dutch Republic, uh, bless them, and Florence. Right. So we're kind of always we always think of. Um, the Dutch as being these, in the kind of period that we're thinking like 17th century, the Dutch as kind of like being very close to the English way of doing things and they set up stock exchanges and they do all this stuff mm -hmm. and they have, you know, trading companies in far flung corners of the world and this stuff and we just assume Enjoy. that that's an early version of capitalism. But what she says is that that's not true, right? So I'll read a, a quote from her where she talks about the lovely Dutch. <clears throat> she says, while the English driven by distinctive market imperatives responded to the European crisis and to the decline of agricultural prices by investing to increase labor productivity and cost effectiveness in agriculture. In the Dutch Republic, during and after the 17th century crisis, there was a process of agricultural disinvestment. As agricultural prices declined, Dutch elites became even more interested in other sources of wealth, such as ex enhanced extra economic commercial advantages or public office, which was more lucrative than investment in land or in other productive enterprises. So she's kind of saying that like when there was this crisis um, for grain prices, right? Um, the English kind of responded to that by doubling down and um, investing in uh, uh, the productive forces investing in we'll get into this a little more specifically later but kind of like the way that they grew their stuff to make agriculture even better enclosures and improvement and that kind of thing we'll get into that um but the dutch one of the things in the dutch republic was that public office was extremely lucrative um so when the kind of like agricultural crisis happened instead of reinvesting in agriculture to make it better and to make more money off of it right in the long run they just kind of said ah, right well forget about it we'll just go back to the old way of doing things where they made money on these um, what she calls extra economic uh, ways of doing things such as like monopolies or um the word that dan and i both learned this week that we didn't bother looking up until we finished the book which was stupid arbitrage mm -hmm. which is uh kind of what dan was describing um which is when you uh, let's say, like, I make uh, uh, I make a lot of beans. Let's say I make a lot of refried beans, right? And everybody in my neighborhood uh, has their own refried beans. So nobody wants to buy my refried beans. So if I was to try and sell my refried beans, it would go at a very low price, right? I go over to the next neighborhood where they don't have any refried beans, and I sell them way at a high price. So that's why I make money off refried beans. Anyway, that's arbitrage, mm -hmm, right? That's yeah. like if you uh, you go to a different market where the prices would be higher and you sell your stuff there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's yeah. that's that's basically what um, what I was getting at with there being a particular type of trade which is thoroughly feudal in its nature. The Dutch, well, and in Florence as well, but the Dutch as well, um, incredibly uh, well advanced, uh, incredibly um, well large uh, urban settlements for their time um huge sums of money accumulated absolutely um, yeah but the 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 the, the well there were, i mean there were, there were several ways in which um feudal uh well the, let's say the ruling class of the of feudal countries were accumulating wealth uh, and we've covered some of them we'll, we we can cover that again in a minute um, but the one that we're talking about now trade um all of the 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 wealth that was was um, accumulated as the result of trade was all done by um, buying cheap and selling dear is what she exactly. says. Like yeah. you go to somewhere else, you either you, well to some, in in some version, versions of it, when we get onto colonialism, you go and actually plunder somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. I mean that's, that's buying like cheap, buying very cheap, <laughs> buying very uh, buying buy, cheap, <laughs> buying cheap, but. Um, <laughs> But also, like, there's more. Yeah, but you can also like literally go and buy somewhere else and then bring it to another market. Um, but the, the advantage here is um, it, we're clearly quite quite clearly not a capitalist scenario in the sense that um, capitalism relies on um, sort of united markets. Like you you sell in one market so that everybody knows what the price of a thing is. Whereas in this instance, the the, the economic benefit comes from disunited disconnected markets you buy in one market and you sell in another and you profit from the difference kind of thing and there you can see like the profit is un unlike capitalism where the profit is made um by um revolutionizing the way you produce or by um 
incentivizing more productive ways of working, the, the profit in this scenario comes in the process of trade. It's not in the process of production. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas as we get when we get onto talking about England and when we got onto talking about capitalism, they were already pioneering or they were already starting to not only incentivize but to compel uh, producers in, in England to um, produce with the market in mind um, and to start acting in ways which are more in line with. Um, capitalist modes of production absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. but also yeah i mean like it's worth also stating some of those other ways for for later on uh, how um uh ruling classes in feudal countries and feudal areas of europe at the time were accumulating their wealth they were still in some ways like accumulating oh go ahead sorry i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say i have a excellent oh an excellent there. quote okay mm. uh, yeah there, there is a cat in the other room sort of meowing and i don't know whether it's getting picked up and maybe i thought maybe it was jack i mean jack might have just told me i'm like get Let's rid of the get cat, cat out. he did something kind of like a <laughs> gesturing over his shoulder no no cat's fine um, love a good cat um anyway, what was how are we, are we gonna cut all of that out and cut it back <laughs> into me making some sense um yeah so uh, yeah yeah uh the feudal ruling class was also still in the game of um, appropriating from their local peasantry. They were still sort of like peasantries on the outskirts of the Dutch Republic or in Florence, um, who they were extracting surpluses from. Um, but as Jack also said, and it's a theme which we're going to develop later on, as feudalism was developing, and in actual fact in France it was kind of f- forming itself into a, a, a potentially an entirely different type of mode of production, um, a sort of a failed one because capitalism came along and supplanted it but um, there was also this growth in um, uh, accumulating wealth through holding various offices of state yeah um, and if you um, if you could hold, if you held a specific position uh, in the state then you could uh, the state used taxation to um, I've lost my train of thought. Anyway. To make money. <laughs> to make money. <laughs> to make money. <laughs> Everybody's just trying to make money. That's uh, what I learned from this uh, book. Uh, Everybody just uh, making money. Um, so yeah, let's talk but about... In different ways. In different ways. Different exactly. systemic ways. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It is interesting to note, though, and I have nothing to say beyond just stating this as a fact. I think it's interesting that um, in the Dutch Republic, and as we'll see in Florence, um, people were just kind of trying to keep things the way that they were. Much like they were in England. I mean, everybody was just trying to socially reproduce themselves as they were. But in England, the circumstances that they found themselves in found themselves socially reproducing themselves. Or I was going to say socially reproducing themselves differently, but that wouldn't be reproducing yourself. <laughs> things changed, yeah. right? And I mean, yeah, things also changed in the mm-hmm. Dutch Republic mm-hmm. and in um, mm-hmm. Florence, but towards mm-hmm. different ends. Mm-hmm. As we saw in France last week, uh, towards an absolutist state. Um, so let's talk a little I'm bit just... more about that tiny little uh, Italian uh, city-state. Um Cat, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat the shit out of that cat. <laughs> you just locked it up. like that's the opposite of what I want. Yeah, I haven't locked the cats oh, okay. outside. They're just upstairs. <laughs> oh, okay, they're outside of this room. I think I'm pretty sure they locked them outside. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, like yeah. it's it's, it's raining. Like two degrees it's like right freezing now. cold outside. <laughs> It's very thin. great. Now it's we're going to have PETA on our ass. You have um, to put some like side violin music. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yes, tiny Italian city state, not tiny. Um, but let's talk about Florence. Nice. Everybody's favorite uh, dome shaped city. Um, so I'll read a quote from Ellen Meekson's Wood. Uh, she says the success of Florentine trade in its own manufactured commodities continued to depend on extra economic factors, on monopoly privileges, or on especially sophisticated commercial and financial practices. Double entry bookkeeping is supposed to have originated there. Um, which facilitated a commerce and goods whose success in a luxury market in any case had less to do with cost effective production, as it would in a capitalist state than with the skills of craftsmanship. So another thing she also brings up is in Florence, it's like, yeah, they were making a bunch of stuff. And they're making like uh, little trinkets and goods, but it was mainly just that. It was like trinkets and stuff that they were selling to like a quote unquote like sophisticated market. So they're basically like, there were craftsmen who made a lot of really good stuff and they were really good at their craft, but that doesn't make a capitalist, right? Just because they're continuing to like enhance the best like way to make a little trinket, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that didn't really have much of a change in social relations. Sure, she, she 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 makes the case that a lot of this. Well, she's arguing that a lot of this feudal trade 
was primarily in luxury goods. I mean, there was some trade of um, sort of everyday household goods and foodstuffs and the like, but um, because there were so because there was so much wealth being accumulated through trade. Um, even sort of domestic markets and sort of like the, also the long range markets as well were mostly minded toward selling luxury goods to uh, the ruling classes of these various countries and the like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Whereas under capitalism, there was this huge growth in um, market for everyday commodities, basically yeah. commodities, basically because we, as we heard last week and we'll hear later, like everybody's life became market dependent. Like, yeah, ev- ev- nobody had. Um, like extra market means to um, facilitate their existence. Yeah, or they, yeah, they, did, they, they didn't have way. any means of production to grow their own food. They don't, yeah. like, or to they, make their own clothes. Or, or yeah, quite. Which like is that. which is what she also says was happening in a lot of these instances. Like mm. um, the the lower classes were still making their own clothes and the like. Mm. Which is interesting because that was one of the big developments in um, American the American kind of economic mode. Um, was that after the Revolutionary War, I think I bought this up a while ago, but that like it did take people a while to kind of make peasants stop making their own stuff because sure. it was like a very much like vote with your feet thing in America where like if you didn't like your uh, job or you didn't like where you lived, after the Revolutionary War, you just got up and moved west. Yeah. So it was like people kept moving more and more into the boonies, more and more into the sticks, kind of like mm-hmm. not re-peasanting mm-hmm. themselves, but like yeah. for the sake of just people like... People wanted to be it. yeomen. They didn't want they wanted to, be. to be a yeoman. That's, yeah, all, yeah. that's all any of us yeah. want is just to be a yeoman. Nobody wants to be working class. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> or um, to be a wage laborer. Right? Yeah. What was I saying last week about not fetishizing feudalism? <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> You've been up the allotment today, Jack. Yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um, but yes... In England, in that foggy little island, uh, with a with a bunch of barbarians uh, and just just savage people, they didn't develop capitalism. That's because of a couple things, right? So the cap, the English kind of way of doing things, uh, as opposed to the Dutch, where the Dutch were just when there was a crisis in agriculture, the Dutch were just kind of like, all right, forget, it. let's go back to the old ways of doing things. For a variety of reasons, the English uh, would go on to. Uh, you know, do their best to maximize profit, to reinvest their surpluses, uh, to invest all of that in efficient production and in productive forces, which is capitalism, right? Like, that's the way it is today. Mm-hmm. Um, when everybody was involved in the market, when these market relations uh, or these social relations changed to become like an adjunct of the market, um, uh, uh, competition made its way into the market and suddenly you're just kind of off to the races, right? Um, but Meekson's Wood also brings up that in order to have capitalism, and this is very much true to, in the present day, obviously, you need um, a materialist base for it, right? And one of the main things she brings up is that, like, you needed good infrastructure to make capitalism happen. So that's kind of like you always hear that, you know, Eisenhower made the roads and the highway systems in America to um, uh, make sure we could uh, bring our missiles uh, anywhere in the country if we needed to, which I'm sure, you know, is part of it, but it was also just because, like, shit, like, we needed it. Like, if we wanted to have, like, a competitive capitalist economy post-war, we really needed to invest in uh, uh, connectedness between the two cities. And that's kind of what she says happens here. So I'll read another quote um, from Meekson's Wood, where she says, the material foundation on which this emerging national economy rested was English agriculture, which was unique in several ways. First, the English ruling class was distinctive in two related respects, which I hate the way she she structures this paragraph. <laughs> on the one hand, demilitarized before any other aristocracy in Europe, it was part of the increasingly centralized state in alliance with a centralizing monarchy without the parcelization of sovereignty characteristic of feudalism and its successor states. While the state served the ruling class as an instrument of order and a protector of property, the aristocracy did not possess autonomous extra economic powers or politically constituted property to the same degree as their continental counterparts. On the other hand, there was what might be called a trade-off on the centralization of state power and the aristocracy's control of the land. Land in England had for a long time been unusually concentrated with big landlords holding an unusually large proportion in conditions that enabled them to use their property in new ways. What they lacked in extra economic powers of surplus extraction, they more than made up for in increasing economic powers. Um, that might have been the wrong quote, but that, that was, proves it was the perfect quote. It was the perfect quote. That was a, that was the perfect quote. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's yeah. You, basically, the idea that's been introduced here. I mean, we've talked about it last week, and we've sort of <laughs> talked about it today. Mm. Um, and it's also an adjunct, or, or it's um, yeah, it, it's very similar to the idea of um, economic and extra economic forms of exploitation being the distinction between capitalism and feudalism. Um, 
but there's this also this distinction between um, the economic and the political and the relationship between the two um, the two realms kind of thing um, under feudalism you can exploit because you have political power um, like um, the thing that allow in a lot of cases in traditional feudalism the thing that allows you to um, exploit in an extra economic manner in the manner which is you go in and taking people's stuff kind of thing um, it's also because you have political power and you have military power um, the the economic and the political are fused uh, under capitalism there is a there is a very um, nuanced and complicated complicated relationship between the economic and the political but the thing that happens in England is the two become um, disconnected kind of thing mm. and I think th- I mean this is th- this seems to be what the from what I can understand, there seems to be a specific difference between the two cases, right? Like very early on, um, basically after the Norman Conquest, or it has its origins in the Norman Conquest and, uh, Conquest and even before, um, you have a um, very well consolidated. Um, well, this, I mean, the, the state, the state is well defined and consolidated. Um, England developed a very powerful state. One, I mean, ruled over by a monarchy, but um, the the state and the the mon- monarchical state in England um, came to take on all of the responsibility for what would be considered to be extra economic power. Um, it had a very well defined, quite well advanced legal system. Um, this the the monarchical state also took responsibility for um, having a, a deploying armed forces i suppose like um so it came to be the case that all the local landlords didn't have they weren't allowed but they also didn't really need uh, a, a military forces of their own but that also meant that they didn't then have those military forces to deploy in in as a means to um further exploit um the peasantry of their uh, respective um thiefdoms <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um, exactly so when you get the separation between the political and the economic, um, it has its various advantages and disadvantages, right? Like the the system. I mean, it, they're, they're obviously <laughs> we're talking about quite a long period of history. There was there was certainly a tumult, mm. um, but it, it was relatively stable, and um, the landlords, the the aristocracy, found themselves in the position whereby they both. Obviously, they were compelled to find new ways of extracting further surpluses from the people that they exploited, the, the, the peasantry. Um, but also, they were at liberty to start to explore those kind of things because the state was so strong and so powerful, and so because they were so because they were protected by it. Basically, um, they didn't they didn't need um, to have their own means to enforce some kind of law because the law was relatively well enforced they didn't yeah. need their own military to protect themselves because they were relatively safe in their position kind of thing castles kind of started to be fancy little like yeah, hangout yeah, places yeah, as opposed yeah, to like yeah, mont bailey yeah, or like norman style yeah, stone yeah, intense yeah. castles but dan you might ask well what were they up to mm-hmm. uh these these old feudal lords and these old kind of punks what were they doing um one of the things they were doing, Dan, was improving the productive forces, and they were doing it very well, and they were doing mm-hmm. it in a number of ways. Um, and the word improvement gets thrown around quite a lot um, because it has kind of taken on this different meaning than you might think that it has. So improvement in the context of like um, agricultural industrialization in 17th and 18th century England um, has come to mean like a kind of a couple specific things. And it isn't necessarily like making the land prettier and better and cooler and greater for everybody, right? Um, before I talk about that, I really want to read one quote where she, uh, Meekson's Wood talks about how, <laughs> again, she kind of idealizes uh, peasant communities back in the day. She says, Peasants have, since time immemorial, employed various means of regulating land use in the interests of the village community. They have restricted certain practices and granted certain rights, not in order to enhance the wealth of the landlords or states, but in order to preserve the peasant community itself, perhaps to preserve the land or to distribute 
to distribute its fruit fruits more equitably and often to provide for the community's less fortunate members. She goes on to talk about how there were common lands where you could just go and chop down some trees if you needed firewood, maybe hunt a couple ducks or something like that if the local lord wasn't going to get mad at you. But then the land gets improved, right? Um, and so improvement is like, uh, it's improved in the sense that it's improving the productive forces. So it's going to make the land more productive. So it's better animal husbandry, um, uh, crop rotation, uh, better tillage, whatever that means. Um, Dan and I, this is a uh, markedly uh, no-till podcast. Um, so, you know, whatever. But they also started to enclose the land. And this is what pissed off, like, everybody in England, right? Other than the people who were doing the actual enclosures. And enclosure is exactly what it sounds like, right? This is 17th century, uh, uh, where are we, England. This is where the land literally starts to be closed off. So those peasant common lands, whatever, where you could just go if you were some schmuck and chop down some trees, whatever, take whatever you needed, that's gone. Can't do that anymore because there's a fence around it now and somebody actually owns it, right? Not only does somebody actually own it, but somebody, uh, that person who owns it probably isn't the one working it, right? The people who are actually working it now are, uh, wa oh, I almost called them wage slaves. Well, you know, wage slaves, wage laborers, whatever. Um, interesting kind of note on the enclosures. I really like how she brought up the point, and I were just talking about this, how if you come to England, um, you can kind of, there are like these little tiny thin paths that you can usually take as a public right away across farmland or across like people's big backyards or something like that. Um, and supposedly, Meekson's Wood said that that uh, is the kind of like, those are the ancestors of uh, of kind of like what happened during enclos enclosures, where like these wage, this new thing of a wage laborer, these people just needed a way to get to work. So that they're like these very tiny paths that you could take mm -hmm. where there was no fence mm -hmm. and you could get to work like that. And so anyway, those still around. I think that's yeah, pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. And you have to stay on those paths. Those, those paths, <laughs> yeah, exactly. on those paths you know, uh, nature. Stay onto the fields. <laughs> nature, beautiful. Um, but that, yeah, so that caused a lot of social upheaval, right? Specifically enclosures. People hated enclosures. Thomas More, I think, famously said that it was, like, literally killing people because um, it was just leading to, like, vagabonds, where there weren't really ever people who wandered around the country not, or not doing anything. Um, but now, all of a sudden, you don't have any land and everything's closed off. You can't just make a living on some empty land that you find um, because there's a fence around it and somebody owns it and they're going to kick you off even if they aren't using it. Um, that's where we get the levelers uh, during the English Civil War and the diggers, who I think we should way down the line maybe do an uh, mm -hmm. episode on. Cause yeah, I don't know very much cool about people. them, nor the English Civil War in general. Uh. Um, she says that one of the things that precipitated the Civil War was um, the Crown's resistance to enclosure. There were enclosures that were starting to happen uh, before the Civil War. But the, the crown and its desire to protect peasants in some, to some extent was resistant. And so it took until the Civil War happened for um, enclosure to really kick off mm -hmm. what's called parliamentary enclosure, like actually parliament mandated um, enclosure on a really large scale. Yeah. And people saw that as being just like against human nature because it's like some of this land that was closed off wasn't even being used. So like if you were just some like loser who lost your land and you were just wandering around the country, you were like, why can't I use this land? That literally doesn't make sense. Nobody's using it right mm -hmm, now. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of become a norm, not just with land that's not being used in our relationship to the environment, but with a lot of other things. Right. But that's just kind of like a capitalist norm. But that's where, yeah, that's where, again, where you get the levelers. Um, I think it was kind of like a derogatory term for them because they were constantly out there, like, working land and stuff and digging at it and stuff. Um, but, yeah, I think that's a really interesting switch. It's kind of, I forget who last week, earlier in the book, was talking about how uh, without state intervention at the onset of capitalism, the, everything would have just been annihilated, mm -hmm. right? Yes, Polanyi. It was Polanyi, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you kind of see what he was getting at now, right? Because it's like, yeah, people were really angry and a pretty bloody war happened. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily just because of that, but that's where a lot of the, at least the kind of like public Yeah, you can see that there was this from. new economic logic developing and it really f flew in the face of all tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and you could, as you were saying before, like that um, there were so many local and cultural means whereby people's survival was protected either by giving them the ability to go and um, just take from unused spaces or use unused spaces or even sort of giving them a sort of portion of crops and that kind of thing um, but no more yeah no more yeah yeah 
real yeah the traditional way of life just being destroyed kind of thing or at least a traditional a feudal way of life yeah being eradicated yeah. shame um i mean wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so it, it, interesting she talks about um the sort of like the origins of the word improvement in and of itself mm. like um that word originally doesn't didn't just mean just, just to, to generally make better but to actually make profitable exactly um, yeah yeah because for most people that probably was not making it better it's like no, there's no, a fence no, no, here no. now no, no, i can't no. get my ducks yeah. i've been hunting that same <laughs> duck family for 50 years 50 generations i'll get one one day um and so because that this was such a monumentous change uh as polini said that threatened to annihilate society there needed to thomas be a more. I don't know. huh maybe thomas more one of the two yeah, both of them. somebody said it both of them. <laughs> um there needed to be a new ideology right that was formed and we get uh, our boy, John also Locke. friend of the pod, <laughs> Jonathan Locke. Uh, I think his name is probably Jonathan, I would imagine. Yeah, John yeah. Locke. Uh, <laughs> your boy, John Locke. It's not J-O-N, is it? It's, it's not J-O-N. J-O-N. Yeah. Yeah. But um, John Locke is interesting because I yeah, never studied John Locke or anything like that. But um, when I was reading this, I was like, oh, man, you're like almost a little kind of like you get a little nibble of something with John Locke. Where you're almost like, oh, he's kind of onto something. You know what I mean? Because he, in this context, in the book, she's talking about his theory of uh, uh, property and ownership and what it means to own something and what is value. Right. And so Locke at first says something along the lines of something becomes yours when you add value to it. Right. Mm. And you're kind of like. Okay, oh yeah, continue. You, you think you're getting a labor theory of value. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're like, nope. <laughs> continue, Locke. I like where you're going with this. But no, sadly, what Locke means uh, by giving something value is not infusing it with your labor, which is a shame. It would take Adam Smith, I would imagine. He was, I don't know, Adam Smith would say that. Um, but what he means is giving it exchange value, right? And so what that means is she elaborates with the example of um, English colonization in the Americas, right? So she brings up that um, Locke would say that Native Americans, even though they technically might have uh, held ownership over the land um, that that they lived on forever, um, Locke would say, no, 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 because that land actually belongs to the English because they're able to give it much more exchange value on the market than these uh, pesky people who already live there. It's not even, uh, I mean, bad enough to, um, (laughs) bad enough to displace um, hunter gatherers from yeah. from the land that they've traditionally maintained themselves by mm. using. And sharing. Um, he's he, he even thinks that even when those those um, native populations are actually engaged in some kind of agriculture, that's still not good enough because the ultimate benchmark is English agriculture. And if you're not producing to the same level as they are in England, then you're still not doing well enough. And it's you. Anybody who still wanted to come along and um, appropriate that land and deploy uh, English methods of agriculture would be entirely within their right, kind of thing. Yeah. And it's interesting, like um, it becomes a real like moral imperative for these people. Like that's what works its way into. I mean, um, we're dealing with somebody who's developing an ideology here, right? Or he's an ideologue. You are, you are. If if you do not use your land and your assets to um the fullest possibility um it's not yours y- yeah 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 but you're, you're, you're doing yours. something morally wrong you know like <laughs> i love that yeah <laughs> you're and, and, and 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 um the saintly english would be within their rights to come and um take over for you yeah, yeah just take over the burden yeah of they're helping because, you like, yeah, yeah we could do so much better but, i wonder how much this caught on as like a popular ideology just because of guilt Guilt over the enclosures, guilt over, you know, colonization, sure, guilt yeah, over yeah, imperialism. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, people yeah. were like, the ruling classes were like, yeah, see? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, it has, surely it has, I mean, it has its analog in this kind of nonsense about like, <laughs> empire was great because we gave them trains and exactly, this kind yeah. of shit. Like, yeah, this bullshit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> this kind yeah, of bullshit. Yeah, yeah. You well, see it like, today, folks. You see it today. Yeah, Still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we're giving yeah, them John and also, financialization. Like, um, it's not just this, were, it's not like this was simply ideology. Um nor was it just a description of economic imperatives, but this kind of way of thinking, and even directly informed by Locke, came to form the basis for uh, law and various like legal precedents, this kind of thing. Like sure. These kind of arguments were made um, in legal cases to, to 
uh, I mean, the, the, basically the entire entirety of the political system was set up to um, aid and advantage the the this sort of the new um, I don't know this new mode of the new mode, appropriation. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll read another quote from her when she talks about Locke because I love kind of how she ties it into the modern day. She says. But Locke is not interested in simply passive appropriation. The point is rather that the landlord who puts his land to productive use, who improves it, even if it is by means of someone else's labor, is being industrious, no less, and perhaps more so, than the laboring servant. And this is a point worth dwelling on. One way of understanding what Locke is driving at is to consider its common usage today, when the financial pages of daily newspapers speak of producers, they do not normally mean workers. In fact, they're likely to talk about conflicts, for example, between auto automobile producers and auto workers or their goddamn unions. She didn't say goddamn. <laughs> editorializing. Um, yeah, I'm editorializing a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think that's really interesting. I mean, you get it with a job creator, like kind of crap too. That's, yeah, yeah, that yeah. still uh, uh, pervades and profanes our uh, politics yeah, yeah, today yeah, yeah. Right? no yeah no no other point in history had the producer had been not the person who was actually engaged in the work of producing something <laughs> yeah. but no like yeah um the person who has the economic power to direct production yeah becomes the becomes the person of sort of um worthy of moral consideration kind of thing yeah um, when i say producer i don't mean that literally <laughs> i mean that much more figuratively <laughs> um yeah, 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 yeah. And so, yes, then she kind of tries to talk about the change then from agricultural industrialization to uh, the Industrial Revolution, right? To industrialization, industrialization, mm -hmm. right? And how those two things are correlated. Because again, you know, for this whole book, I said this last week, but she's talking about periods a lot earlier than people usually talk about when they talk about the origin of capitalism in England, right? Um, to say nothing of like people when they talk about the origin of capitalism in like ancient Greece, which like mm -hmm. you can't see what I'm doing with my hand, but like give me a break. Um, so she, yeah, she tries to explain how then you get to that point of industrialization and how um, agricultural industrialization facilitated that, right? So I'll read uh, a little quote where she's kind of being a little bit contentious. She admits that she's being a little contentious. She says, finally, and this is no doubt a more contentious point than my previous one, without English capitalism, there would probably have been no capitalist system of any kind. It is com It was competitive Oh, it was competitive pressures emanating from England, especially an industrialized England, that, in the first instance, compelled other countries to promote their own economic development in capitalist directions. States still acting on pre-capitalist principles of trade or geopolitical and military rivalry, hardly different in principle from older feudal conflicts over territory and plunder, would be driven by England's new competitive advantages to promote their own economic developments in similar ways. She basically says that um, agrarian capitalism made industrialization uh, possible, right? She goes on to say the conditions of possibility created by agrarian capitalism, the transformations in property relations, in the size and nature of the domestic market, in the composition of the population, and in the nature and extent of British trade and British imperialism were more substantial and far-reaching than any purely technological advances required by industrialization. So again, she's pushing back on the commercialization model of the origin of capitalism, which is just, we made the cotton gin, we made the steam engine baby, and then it was off to the races because it's like this. No, well, that's a te the technologically deterministic yeah. notion as well. well. We don't like those people around yeah, here. Yeah, we yeah. don't like technological <laughs> determinists. We like economic determinists. No, just kidding. Um, but yeah. yeah, yeah, it's only it's it's only by ver like it's this it's the new system of. Um, uh, agricultural capitalism that develops in England, which allows for it both um, creates a large body of um, displaced uh, people who would come to be wage laborers and a new working class, mm. the majority um, of whom would probably move to London, right? Quite, London yeah. Would just swell yeah, yeah, in yeah, size. yeah, yeah, yeah. But all, yeah, and also it, um, it, yeah, related to that, it also because because um, uh, the the process the agricultural process is becoming so much more productive you can support a much larger population on a relatively small um i mean it's still it's still large by modern standards but like the the base of there was a, the number of people living and working um in an agricultural setting began to diminish and the number of people who were then freed up to um move into cities particularly london london grew enormously kind of thing mm. and not comparable to any other european city uh, in its size and scale um 
Yeah, it just so really created yeah. a surplus population, right? Yeah. So while you had this one force that was basically kind of giving a little bit of an opening, a little bit of a market to people who were willing to work for a wage, um, that kind of just became part of the circle of like, well, then more wage laborers means more people are getting dispossessed of their land, which means more people can buy more of the like minority of people who have the means to do so can buy up land, they can improve it, get more wage laborers, more people are dispossessed from the land, more people are moving into cities, more people need commodities to be made because they're not making them themselves, more jobs, more wage labor, mm -hmm. just snowballs from there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and also um, by having all these people that are now dependent on a wage, you're all, they're also dependent on the market to um, gain the means of their subsistence. Um, you then develop this really large internal market for the selling of goods kind of thing. Exactly. Um, yeah. So whereas like um, in other places in Europe, a lot of trade was like uh, over great, uh, over long distances and trade between different markets. What was developing in England was a one singular market. Um, and then what you can also have um, is division of labor between different regions. If you, if you can move things about relatively easily um, you can compare the products of one area with the products of another. Um, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and then that kind of snowballs into the other I word we're going to talk about, other than idea, other than ideology. Just touched a cat toy and it made a weird noise. Um, we're going to talk about imperialism, baby, um, because she brings up that there's a connection between British capitalism and British imperialism, not vice versa. Well, kind of vice versa at the same time, right? So I'll read another quote. She says, capital is not only uniquely driven to extend its economic reach, but also uniquely able to do so. The self-expansion of capital is not limited to what the capitalist can squeeze out of the direct producers by direct coercion, nor is capital accumulation confined within the spatial range of personal domination. By means of specifically economic or market imperatives, capital is uniquely able to escape the limits of direct coercion and move far beyond the borders of political authority. This makes possible both its distinctive forms of class domination and its particular forms of imperialism, mm -hmm. right? Um, so she doesn't touch on uh, slavery too much in this book, um, very briefly, actually. Um, but she kind of makes the point about how, like, whereas the Spanish in their forms of imperialism were obviously exploiting the people who lived in say like what's now Central America or South America or North America for that matter. Um, what they were really concerned with wasn't really trade. It was just taking as much gold as they could possibly mm -hmm. do, right? Taking as much silver as possible. Mm -hmm. And that led like, <laughs> they had it good for a little while because they were getting all this gold, but it basically led immediately to the fall of the monarchy because they were like, now we have too much gold. We don't know what to do with it. Um, but then, like, the British were doing something different, right, with their imperialism. When they went to America, they were kind of a little bit more interested in setting up commodity markets and setting up trade. And to do that, they obviously needed uh, a workforce. Most of the guys who were involved in the Civil War um, in England, guys like, uh, who I can't, guys like the people whose names I can't remember right now, they all were basically, um, a lot of the parliamentarians were pretty involved in setting up the colonies in New England, right? And they basically went to Virginia, like the Virginia colony and places like this. And they kind of went, uh, okay, this is great. We can do a lot with this, but, you know, we don't really have like a labor force right now. We need uh, people to uh, infuse these products with their labor to not give it value, but to give us value, right? And so one way that they did that was obviously slavery. Um, that was by far the most brutal way that they did it, obviously. But they also did it just through like handing out pamphlets in the poor neighborhoods of Berlin and handing out pamphlets in the poor neighborhoods of like Paris and then London and just basically being like, you get a free boat ride to America if you'll sign a contract to work for us for a couple of years. So it was a lot more, uh, obviously, you'll see like these market imperatives acting in English col um, colonialization, colonization, I would say it like that, um, whereas you kind of won't see it in, say, like, Canada, where the French were kind of just interested in, like, getting fur, and that was about it, you know, they just getting the fur, send it back to the Metropole, that's it, Spanish, get the gold, send it back to the Metropole, send it to China, send it to the Philippines, whatever, that's it, um, yeah, and it is, it is really interesting just seeing the ways that England, because of these social relations that it set up, colonized in a pretty different way. I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, Spain and France, um, incredible, they were basically interested in extraction of wealth. Um, what the English were engaged in was um, settler colonialism. Yeah. Um, they really wanted to settle. Um, they set up, like, large uh, conurbations. 
<laughs> they didn't want to say settlements again. <laughs> <laughs> they settled in these settlements for settlers. They settled, 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 settled in the settlements. Listen, they settled. <laughs> <laughs> they settled. <laughs> and I, I, as we were saying with Locke, right, there was a reason why um, so much of his uh, propagandizing, for want of a better word, was mm. directed against North. Well, talked about North America and was di- directed against the North Americans. There, he was really trying to set up a justification for actually going, for settling, and for actually introducing um, capitalist modes of, um, well, English modes of agriculture, but behind that, um, economic logics motivated by capitalist principles, Mm. um, the requirement to actually engage in modifying the process of production to make it more productive, as opposed to... um, the French and the the Spanish, who didn't really have any interest in actually modifying the the way things were produced. Mm. All they wanted to do was to take and then to um, gain their profit by um, trading those things in another market. Yeah, arbitrage about, like, again. Arbitrage basically. as opposed, yeah. like the English were interested in a profitable production, whereas the non-capitalist European powers were interested in profitable trade. Yeah. Yeah, and sort of like the extra and used extra economic advantage to to do that by having like dominant access to trade routes and the like. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And so that's that's more or less where she kind of leaves the theory of um, the origins of capitalism. She ties it up in a really neat way that I really like where she um, goes back to that idea of that kind of Polanyi's idea of like no capitalism, like these new social relations, these new social forms, these new ways of uh, these new market imperatives and stuff. They need a state, right, to make sure that uh, everything doesn't just fall apart because it's so brutal and so contradictory and so uh, 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 wrong. Um, She basically says that uh, this is still true to this day, right? Very much true with the coronavirus thing um, and the kind of like Fed spending Uh, that we've seen in recent times, specifically in June, just basically directly lending to banks and stuff like that. Um, But I'll quote her again because she explains it very, very well. She says that capitalism remains dependent on extra economic conditions, political and legal support. As much as global capital might like a corresponding global state, the kind of day-to-day stability, regularity, and predictability required for capital accumulation is inconceivable on anything like a global scale. To be sure, there does exist a military power whose scope is as close to global as the world has ever seen. Mm. Yet, however successful... What are you talking about there? Yeah, I know. I don't know. Would it be the British? I don't know. Maybe not the British. Um, Yet, however successful the constant threat of U.S. military power may be in enforcing the global economy, the nature and capabilities of such a military power are are completely at odds with capital's daily needs. High-tech bombing, however smart, it's hardly designed to create stable and predictable social... I kind of like that dig about, like, uh, yeah, uh, bombing. Uh Not a fan... This is an anti-bombing podcast. Um, but yeah, I mean, she, she makes a really good point, right? And she ties it up really neatly at the end of the book, um, before she gets into the post-modernity stuff, where she basically says that, um, the state still props up all of these capitalists, right? Um, the reason I bought up the coronavirus thing was because, like, most of the companies listed on, uh, Dow Jones probably would have collapsed and not grown during coronavirus if it weren't for direct state intervention, um, introducing money into markets, um, which were obviously not, like, against people you know not getting money or anything like that we're just talking about like you know big companies being propped up otherwise the contradictions of capitalism would have just kind of completely blown the entire market up um and she makes i really like her uh saying yeah there's no global state because that wouldn't work because you can't have the same rules for like an exploited country like the philippines or something like that as you would for france right because that would just be completely contradictory and it would just be way too obvious what you're doing, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm, Um, But you still do need something, uh, a organizing body like the U.S. military to kind of come in when things start to get a little weird, you know, when things are kind of slipping, quote-unquote slipping, um, as one might say when things are moving forward, um, to kind of come in and quote-unquote correct what's going on, right? So you can't have a global state because that'll kind of make the contradictions of capitalism be way too contradictory Mm -hmm. but um yeah i do like what she's saying about how the state plays that role i mean she basically basically makes the argument that um capitalism starts in england um because it has quite a unique um state 
And for a while, capitalism is bounded within one state and the two are sort of synonymous with each other. But of course, capitalism escapes these bounds in a way that um, the state can't expand with it. Exactly. Um, I mean, I don't know whether this is an aside or not, but we quite like an aside. Yeah, we love a good aside. Um, (laughs) um, She basically makes the case that England is the only place where capitalism emerged organically. Um, It was with the other European powers. It was basically just that England was um, out competing them. It was producing far more profitably, and also then could develop like um, could came to dominate world trade. It developed the biggest empire in the world. obviously like had the the biggest sort of military presence kind of thing um and french absolutism just couldn't compete and so um coming back to the like the relationship between capitalism and the state like it took state intervention in germany but also in france kind of thing sure. to actually start to enforce these new uh, capitalist norms um and logics which um were quite were still resisted and um it, not really understood by um, the local populace, kind of thing. Exactly. Um, yeah, I do find that I found that uh, that chapter on the state, or that section on the the state, really interesting. It's something that I'd like to really get into um, because we, I, I have, a, I think we have a tendency to sort of just assume that um, capitalism or the the yeah capitalist economics function uh, relatively well on their own. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not saying that I have like I make any libertarian assumptions. Like, I don't oh. think that uh, capitalism can survive without the state, kind of thing. But um, she's really suggesting that there is an everyday kind of propping up of capitalism, which is done by uh, nation states, um, which I feel like you don't necessarily. Exp- I mean, you can. I suppose you can look for it in various places. You can look for it when there's any sort of breakdown of law and order, kind of thing. But I suppose also like um, it comes into play when you just you need a legal system. To, to protect private property, things, right? To protect private property, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. But it's one of those things that is said rhetorically: the state, the state is there to protect private property. Yeah. Um, but it's sort of only when you look back into history and you can see these sort of more, um, you can see when um, capitalism is in its sort of more infant phases, um, and when there are other sort of competing uh, modes of production that you can start to try and understand what a phrase like that means kind of thing or exactly. it's much easier to see what a phrase like that means when you're actually seeing capitalism be instituted yeah instead um, of people just running around with like anarchy symbols being like a cab bro yeah yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah yeah once upon a time you needed a state through enclosure um and the like yeah. to actually like i love put, yeah. put in place the 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 Relations of private property, which now capitalism, the state serves to protect, kind of thing. Yeah, I love, I love that idea. The way there's the picture, the little picturesque pictures she paints of peasants back in the day. That was a lot of peas. What's a great? I mean, what's a really great chapter in this? But one, what's a nice thing? A nice, uh, another nice aside, <laughs> <laughs> um, prompted by another aspect of this book. Mm. She's she's talking about how we think about like quaint merry England, <laughs> and like we look back on it and as if that's like. Um, what we can see now as the green and present land of England yeah. is kind of like yeah, yeah, yeah. is is um, we we think what we can see there is sort of like um, pre-industrial, yeah. even f- like uh, a feudal landscape kind of thing. And she's like, no, that's not true at all. What you see now when you look at England, the large fields, the really grand farmhouses, all the little all the little um, uh, right of way, <laughs> oh sure, yeah. and the like kind of thing. Um, they're all the hobbits. <laughs> quite the hobbits. Yeah. <laughs> um, they are all symbols of agrarian capitalism. Exactly. They're not symbols of um, of any sort of quaint feudal past kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. And she and she's. I mean, she. There's a few times when I mean, this book was written well, uh, written in the nineties, but added to in the two thousands. There's a few times when she references things like. Um, Mad cow disease. Oh yeah, and, and foot and mouth, <laughs> yeah. foot which and were mouth. sort of like the um, foot and mouth disaster. Prominent stories eighteen years ago, <laughs> um, but still of significance now, right? And maybe maybe we can talk about things like the coronavirus, uh, exactly. Yeah, or, wet um, markets, or wet markets, or um, increased antibiotic resistance because of the use of antibiotics in farming, kind of thing. Like she says that sometimes the case is made that people look back to say the post World War Two period um, when industrial agriculture came to. Um, when when events like those the sort of various levels of catastrophe or sort of like 
um, those various diseases and that kind of thing, the things that caused those were set in train in the post-World War II era. But really what she's saying is there is a line to be drawn all the way from um, the misadventures of corporate agriculture now, all the way back to the very basic origins of capitalism yep. and um, the the ways um, agricultural producers at the, the dawn of capitalism started to intervene um, in the productive process to make it more profitable and to make it more productive. Um, and it's that line of reasoning that's gotten us all the way to the point where, yeah, I don't know, antibiotic yeah. resistance is growing because... Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, good book. Uh -huh. Very uh -huh. good book. I definitely enjoyed reading it. It makes me want to read, hearing you say that, makes me want to read something like a Marxist view of ecology in some way. I think that'd be interesting sure. to get yeah, into. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sometime down the line. Yeah, yeah. We need a, I, I need a breather after this one. Yeah, Because yeah. I read like 100 pages yesterday. <laughs> so I need, need something a little soft um, to come up. Um, a couple ideas. Nice. Yeah, we'll we got nice. some couple ideas. Maybe the aliens. The aliens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I'll end this as we should. Um by reading the last paragraph. So that was a very good last paragraph. All right, go ahead. Um, she, spoiler alerts, capitalism happens. She says, as capitalism spreads more widely and penetrates more deeply into every aspect of social life and the natural environment, its contradictions are increasingly escaping all our efforts to control them. The hope of achieving a humane, tr truly democratic and ecologically sustainable capitalism is becoming transparently unrealistic. But although that alternative is unavailable, there remains the real alternative of socialism. Dun, nice. dun, dun. Nice, nice, nice. Um, yeah, classic. Yeah, love it, yeah, yeah, love it, love it, love yeah, it so much. She goes in on markets, like even market socialism at the end. She doesn't bring up like Yugoslavia <laughs> or anything like that, but I kind of like that. She's like, yeah, God yeah, damn, yeah, markets yeah. don't even work in socialism. Um, yeah. yeah. We, need, we need a shift in um, social, social organization as stark and shocking as the shift that happened between feudalism and capitalism. But hopefully better. But yeah, we I mean, we want a different body, a different type of person to be shocked. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. And we want to return the world to a more humane way of treating people. And the way we're going to do planet, that. And the animals. Exactly. And the animals, especially yeah. the animals, especially yeah. the cats that Dan just locked out in the literal freezing cold. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so way... right, yeah, don't, uh, don't you with your ad hominem attacks. <laughs> Don't judge my the, the socialism the, the, never the works. Quality of my political gentlemen. aspiration by my actual deed. <laughs> <laughs> um, the way we're going to do that, by the way, change these social relations is wherever you see a fence, any fence at all, no matter what it is, just rip it down, baby. Rip that fence down. That's yeah, how we're yeah, going to yeah, do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Hate yeah. fences on the yeah. show. Take one step off of the uh, the the rights yeah. of way. Yeah, ex yeah exactly. Yeah. Walk oh, yeah. all over inch the farmers' a, field. Inch that fence like an inch over yeah, 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 slowly yeah, expand yeah, it yeah, until yeah. you have the whole estate no one will notice <laughs> that um, fence has been broke there's a there's a there's a little there's a little walk that we quite like to do and um oh yeah there was there was a gap in the fence that we used once before and there's a farmer that's very desperate to stop people <laughs> using that gap in that fence and it it's, keeps it's getting really taken funny. down <laughs> it's really funny it's like he puts up the, the like i'm pretty sure it is like a legal gap in the fence because it looks very official but like the way that the farmer is like covering it back up is he gets like a pallet and a bunch of bailing wire yeah, yeah. And, like ties it up and then you come back and it's all just torn down yeah yeah um, i don't i don't know whether it's i wrote ramblers or just yeah. some oaks but god bless those oaks <laughs> for going out I'm and just te tearing down oh, i don't know just is an oik ra a rapscale Oh, okay. Uh, I was gonna yeah, say it's yeah. not a slur, is it? It's, I don't think it. I don't think it's a slur. <laughs> Goddamn no, 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 no. Um I don't know. Yeah, I don't um, want to say. Yeah. Didn't yeah. want to say. Think, you I know think, what I was gonna think, say. Think, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, not that this has anything to do with what you just said, but there was a part in this book that we didn't talk about that. Uh, if you all read this book, which you should, uh, take special note of is about Ireland, which is really interesting. Um, she talks all about imperialism and British imperialism and oh, kind of like so, yeah, there's so much stuff. to There's a lot into. we didn't get to, there's but so how like to yeah, about how not only was Ireland kind of like a testing ground for Tudor era and then like British like fully like kind of mo more modern -y era imperialism, but also for capitalist practices in general. So look that up. Look out for that on the books. Um, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. I did just read the last paragraph, so we're not going to get back into it. Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Overall, it's officially done. <laughs> it's officially done. Goddamn, we can't go back. Overall, uh, very good. Not as much Miliband as I would have liked. No. But um, she's just as good. We'll I'll find say it. Some, we'll find some. <laughs> we'll find maybe, some more Miliband. <laughs> we should eventually finish that book, the Miliband book. Yeah, maybe that's. I don't know what. Yeah, I don't know what I want to. I don't know. 
Yeah. I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what I want to do. Yeah. Some, I don't know what, what, yeah, what we're going to do for next time. Yeah. We'll figure it out. We'll find out. There will we'll be an episode out. next week. Um, yeah. Hang tight. Hang in there. Hang tight. Yeah. I know you want more, everybody, but we'll get there. Um, yeah. That's that. Anything this else? Is this yeah, I guess this I is a know. wrap. I don't know. I'm gl- I am don't want to bring up the election anymore. So I'm yeah, no, saying no. yes. Let's know. wrap it, baby. Yeah, what else is going on? Uh, what else is going on? No, no, uh, no. Corbin's still gone. Um, so that's good. Um, as I said before, we'll have Biden uh, ish- uh, bringing forth socialism, which will be nice. Um, yeah, not too much else going on. It's kind of just election, election, election. Yeah. <laughs> we call it quits. Let's call it quits. <laughs> All right, thank you for listening. Yeah, it's this has been Auxiliary pleasure. Statements. It's been a pleasure. Been a pleasure. Um, I'm Jack. I'm Dan. Um, enjoy the rest of your week. We'll see you next time. The music you heard this episode was Music to Kill Bad People 2 by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. You can check out this song and more on their Bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com. If you like this episode, be sure and follow us up at Ox Statements on Twitter. That's A-U-X Statements on Twitter.com. And be sure and tune in next episode for more commie discussion. Till next time. Yeah.